This is the state of the nation. Ibifa Mubwana. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Sal. Welcome to the State of the Nation. My name is Henry Sully. Uh, before we start, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto African Alumni Association operates. For thousands of years, it, ha for, for thousands of years it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendant, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across the Tato Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Again, welcome to the State of the Nation. My name is Henry Sully, uh, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, it is the Independence Day, long weekend for Ugandans. Uh, it is also the Thanksgiving weekend for Canadians. Uh, so for all the Canadians watching us, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, for the people who live in Toronto and the neighboring cities, <clears throat> I have a message for you. Uh, your city has become a center of interest uh, to the NRM government. And I acknowledge that uh, we have been indoors for so long for so long right now because of COVID. And because many of you are excited about uh, the events that are happening around the city. Tegeza, um, you are going to go all out. Your city, like I'm saying, don't quote me. Ne ngawe bavuli de. City has become a center of interest uh, to the uh, dictatorship. Uh, this weekend there are several, 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 several high-profile uh, agents, and there's a lot of money being thrown around. Uh, so you know you about Ambu Day. Making a show of ku invent you now Ugendo Oli Day. If you're buying liquor or something like that, making a show. Uh, when your beer go my small leader, other liquors, uh, I would ask you to limit it to having it at your homes. Uh, but just be careful, be 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 very careful. As we demo the dem bangaliza Thanksgiving and noonji, ababa dem kuchaka la jo, uh, nek Friday, uh, wamba mufunyo wood dem again, they come mobile, a warm saw, a mum called blood work, uh, making a show and uh, you are safe. Uh, you are called to go. But this weekend, we are going to discuss indigenous Ugandans' uh, fate, Spe specifically those ones who are, who are carrying uh, uh, foreign passports and not Ugandan passports per se. Uh, that's, we are going to be discussing the fate of those uh, Ugandans. We are going to, to discuss the, the, the dual citizenship law, uh, the recent changes within the immigration, uh, not the act per se, but the implementation of that act uh, as it pertains to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So I hope you are as excited uh, to engage in this conversation as I am. Uh, I am very excited to, to engage in this conversation. I have two panelists uh, in, uh, in the studio today. Uh, both of them are unknown, at least uh, to North America. One is known because he has been participating on this uh, platform for a while now. The other one is known because he is the former uh, deputy speaker for UNA uh, and a community leader uh, within the Maryland area. Uh, so I am going to invite them to introduce themselves, uh, starting with... Uh, the former deputy speaker, Mr. Albert uh, Bakasara, you're welcome once again to the State of the, uh, the, the Nation Dialogue, uh, and I hope you're excited to be here. It's been a while since we last saw each other. How are you doing today? I'm good, Henry. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, of course, I'm excited to be here. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to join my panelists, Julius. Good, nice meeting you. Um, 
Well, my name is, as you said, is Albert Bakasara. I'm, uh, yes, the former deputy speaker of UNA, but uh, even before UNA, <laughs> I've been uh, um, an activist and a leader in my community for, for a while now. Um, um, I'm a married man. I work for the federal government, and uh, I live right outside Washington, D.C., uh, in the suburbs of, uh, uh, of D.C. I work for the federal government, uh, although I'm not here as a representative of uh, the Biden administration or the any in any capacity in that area. Um, but I think the subject that uh, we're going to discuss today is one of uh, interest to all, including myself. Uh, so that is why uh, I gladly accepted to be on the show today. And thank you so much for keeping these conversations going uh, amongst ourselves and uh, enlightening our community and empowering our community. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Albert Bakasara. Uh, the next is going to be uh, my colleague uh, and my uh, friend as well. Uh, so, Mr. Julius Mitala Muswangali Muzukuru, Muzukuru wa Muswangali, Mitala Julius. Uh, before I, I, I know you are going to introduce yourself, but Oksokira Dayanjagala Okutusa Oksasira Kwange Joli, I know you lost a sister who lives here in Canada. Uh, specifically about Ford, Chitalonyo, where that was filled with our many Yokoyo, era to to so success that was fejoli. As uh, people of Canada, uh, people of Toronto, people of Abbot Ford, uh, Vancouver, Chitalonyo, uh, what's going on? How do you want us to help? Uh, but first, for introduce yourself. Uh, yes, Henry. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody who's uh, following and watching us today. Julius Mitala is my name. Muzukuruam Swangali. Mitala Muzukuruam Swangali is my screen name. I've said it and I've emphasized it here on many occasions that I use that name purposely in recognition of my grandfather, the man who made me who I am. So I'm always grateful to all his assistance that uh, enabled me to become the, the man who I am. I am a regular here with Henry. We always meet here on Sunday to join new colleagues and friends, you know, or wherever you are to be, to make sure that we have uh, a healthy discussion about a number of issues pertaining, uh, you know, to our uh, different circumstances. Whatever we do, wherever we live, whatever we do, you know, there are so many things that concern us uh, as people in the diaspora, how we live and how we interact, you know, with each other, and how we are able to, how we, we could possibly be able to influence, you know, policy and uh, government back uh, in our home country, which is something that's very critical. My background is legal. I'm legally trained. People do always tend to say to me that, you know, uh, you are a mental health lawyer. What else do you know? I think that's a question I'll, I'll need to attack uh, on, a, on a different occasion. But obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm knowledgeable across all areas. Mental health happens to be my special interest. Just as you find that somebody does uh, constitutional law or international law or employment law, when you go through legal training, you, you, you choose a specific domain where you want to become an expert. And for me, mental health, because of, of what it is, you know, it affects uh, lots of people you know, at so many different levels. People sometimes don't even know that they, they are suffering from mental health. But in order for you to make sure that your rights are protected, when you get to interface you know, with, the, with the different restrictions that apply or that setting when you become you know detained under the mental health legislation in whichever country whether in, in, in the western world or whether in africa or wherever it happened to be it's a crucial conversation that needs to be to be had and i think it requires people who have a degree of expertise in that area to be able to to deal with those sorts of challenges so that's my area of interest and uh, what more could I say? Um, I'm looking forward for the exchange. Um, I wish to appreciate Henry uh, for all the time and effort that you've spent with me over the last uh, difficult days. Uh, obviously, I lost a sister. She was, she was a very dear sister to me. Uh, we grew up together. Uh, she came immediately after me. Uh, we had not been in touch for a couple of months or possibly a year. Uh, for reasons that pertain to family dynamics, as everybody does know, you when you do have siblings, you can fight, you can quarrel, lots of things can happen, and then one somebody says, well, I don't want to speak to you, you know, for a couple of months, and then out of that scenario, 
the last thing I heard that uh, my sister had passed away and uh, she had been suffering with uh, a heart condition, uh, which meant that her heart stopped working and uh, she couldn't make it any longer. Uh, it's, it's a very sad kind of uh, weekend for me, as, a, as myself and my, and my family back home and those who are, you know, wherever they are, we are trying to cope with this. We are trying to arrange uh, to see that uh, her wishes can be met, whether she can be repatriated back home for a burial. And if it's, that's not possible, then we shall, we shall have to see you know, what else could be available. So in that respect, uh, I'm calling upon the Ugandan network in Canada. I think crucially for the important thing is that when she, since she's passed away, she has left behind two children who have not been living in the country for a very long period of time. And it is possible that those children will be devastated, you know, by what has happened. One of those kids is just 13 years old. Uh, we do not have an extended family network in Canada. So it is important, you know, that the Ugandan Canadian community steps into, you know, into the arena at this point in time and try to see what kind of support can possibly be available to these young people. But I think that is besides the point. Uh, let's carry on the discussion, Henry, and uh, all the other issues can be considered outside this meeting. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much again. Uh, again, Chitalo Nyoko, uh, to Fididua Komanyoko. It is not beside the point. I think it's an important aspect to this conversation because we are talking about citizens, uh, diaspora Ugandans. Uh, and when we talk about diaspora Ugandans, we have to remember uh, that sometimes we go back home when we are still alive. Uh, but there are times when we go back home, uh, when you are uh, uh, in uh, caskets. And if you are going back in caskets and we do not have uh, that dual citizenship, if we are uh, citizens of other countries and carrying different uh, passports, how is that going to be dealt with? Because it's not mentioned in the law uh, that uh, the act, uh, the Immigration Act or the dual citizenship this citizenship act that we are going to discuss here today. Uh, but before we delve into that conversation, uh, I just want to get a few comments from you regarding uh, the independence that happened yesterday, uh, what you think about it, and whether you think we are heading in the right direction. Before you start, I'm going to play something uh, uh, done by the BBS. Uh, thoughts of people who are on the ground in Kampala and what they think about Uganda ya fame. Buri mwaka mbade manyiti, buri mwaka bagwera tweyongera kula. Ne buri mwaka bagwera tweyongera kudda wansi. Sima inchi vakuchi. Kando jikoze mu chikwe ngo. Sina chena ko ze mu rwesonga. Misoro minji. Batumala ke mirembe kale bwendo. Kwacho ina tafali yo kasakusi. Atediri ko. Kwachi. Wembe <laughs> Right, all right, all right. Uh, I know so many rosy pictures have been going around, uh, which is good. We need to, to, to talk about the, the good aspects of the of the country uh, and what makes people happy. Um, there are so many different events in so many different diaspora communities celebrating independence. On the other hand, uh, when you look at these testimonies uh, from Kampala on the ground, uh things may not be as as well as they they could be and i wonder what your thoughts are uh i wonder uh what uh, people back home are telling you about uh independence celebrations at 59 are we on the right track i want to start with uh who is who wants to start bakasara <laughs> Unmute yourself. Start. Make that start the conversation. Let's go. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 
I'll start the conversation and thank you for the opportunity. And again, uh, uh, Julius, my condolences, and I agree with uh, Henry, uh, it's not besides the point, that is actually the point uh, why we're here. Um, um, so to start the conversation, what, what, Uganda at 59, what, what does it mean for me? Um, I, I saw in one of the clips that you just played uh, where the young man was talking about uh, yeah? that feeling persecuted, restrained, whatever the, the, the correct definition is in English. Huh? Right. And I right. also happen to be one of the, uh, uh, to have uh, listened to the, can you hear me? I happen to yeah, also have listened to yeah. the Kabaka's speech. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah, and he also talked about that some aspect of it. Then they open to So it, it is there, it's present. Uh, and you are right. We come out of a very beautiful place. Uh, and uh, for some of us, it's even a double uh, uh, in, in Toro where I come from we call it the power in the power of Africa <laughs> right. so you cannot come out of a place like uh, uh, Toro uh, and, 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 and say there's nothing good about Uganda it, it was just right. inconsistent with even the place that you come from but uh, the journey has been long it has been challenging for historical reasons, and also the self-inflicted wounds, the for unforced errors that uh, uh, we have seen so often. So it's a mixed bag. We have the good things, and we have the not so good things that are happening in Uganda. What I don't agree with are, are these silos where we picked ourselves and then and, and placed ourselves if somehow I point something that is wrong or going wrong in Uganda people think I don't love Uganda that's a false, a false narrative and on the other side if people who are saying oh Uganda is so good Uganda is so good on this side uh, maybe quite often we label them as the people who are oblivious to, to, to the suffering of our, of, of, of our fellow Ugandans. But the truth of the matter is, uh, well, the truth is actually in the middle. It, it's just that these conversations have to highlight that truth. We need to be able to talk about the good of Uganda, the Uganda we know, and the Uganda we aspire to see, at the same time, also pin a point where we have challenges, where we have these enforced errors in, in the human rights area, in, 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 in um, missed opportunities in, 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 in uh, the flagrant economy, in, um, and uh, the issues that we're about to talk about regarding. Uh, dual citizenship and, and the freedoms of our important diaspora community, where the government can do, what the government can do, where they can help us to help our motherland. So those are conversations that can take place at the same time. We don't have to pick it at all. So for me, Uganda at 59, happy independence. We have a long way to go. We have a whole bunch of things to fix and they say let's get to work it's going to be the duty of everyone including us who are privileged and living in these um, places but the people at home have to also give us a chance to market our country differently i was on a, a similar show yesterday and i talked and highlighted the importance of uh, our ambassadorship roles. We are the ambassadors of Uganda in this country, in the country, in Canada, in the US, wherever we are as Ugandans. We're the ambassadors. Whether the government of Uganda likes that or not, they're not going to be able to change it. I know before we came out live, we were having a conversation about uh, um, paper pushers in the halls of power. 
Yeah. Actually, somebody cleaning Joe Biden's office, if they happen to be Uganda, uh, Ugandan, that person has access to Joe Biden that the president of Uganda or the ambassador of Uganda doesn't have. And for the mom, when they start talking and they ask them, where are you from? And they say, I'm from Uganda. They're going to have the same conversations that you just played for us on the streets of Kampala. They are going to talk about Uganda from their personal perspective. If that perspective is good, that's the message they will give Joe Biden. If that perspective is one of being oppressed, that's the perception they will give Joe Biden. And then you would wonder, well, why hasn't our president been invited to sit and, uh, um, for, for a sit down with, with the president of the US in, in the White House? Well, that could be the reason that the person who cleans his office is Ugandan. <laughs> and they have just represented Uganda before even your ambassador gets there. So that's the importance that I wanted to highlight at least today for the government of Uganda to realize that we are the ambassadors of Uganda here. How the government treats us is the personal perspective that we will talk to or that we will advance when we meet Americans, Canadians, or whatever we are across the, the, the globe. It's the lens that we see, the, 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 the Uganda that we'll, we will present will be through our personal lenses. So how can Uganda help? Well, you, there's some unforced errors. Human rights. If you oppress my brother in Uganda, the people who are being jailed and thrown in jail and, and killed and, and summary, uh, all those people have relatives and some of them are outside Uganda. You cannot tell me that I should give only a beaming picture of Uganda and not talk about the ills of Uganda as how the president was suggesting the other day in, uh, in his speech that we are noisemakers and we have our issues and no, we are making noise or at least some of the things we're making noise about are real and they are real to us. If you've jailed my brother, I'm going to talk, I'm going to scream. I will talk to every co-worker in my office about that experience. When I take a day off to deal with that personal matter, I will discuss it with my bosses. Say, hey, I'm going to take a day. We have to make calls to, to lawyers in Uganda. My, my, my brother's in jail. I'm representing Uganda. And when you meet that person, that thing, that's the impression of Uganda that they will have. So it's not that we're out here purposely um, giving Uganda a bad name or somebody has paid, off, has, has, has paid us off to go badmouth Uganda in our circles. No, we are representing Uganda from our personal experiences. It's incumbent upon the government of Uganda and the leaders of Uganda to recognize that and give us the good stories, give us the good personal experiences that we can use to highlight a better Uganda. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bakasara. Uh, you have said it so well, uh, and I think it's it's very important for people to realize that the personal is communal and the communal is personal. Uh, so I only describe the beauty of my community uh, through the lens that that community has treated me. Uh, that's how I explain the beauty of my community or the ugliness of my community. Uh, and another thing, Muruganda tulina orugelo orugamba anti ensoele kwa gala ye kugwa kubwa. That fly that does not like you, tejo kujia kukube ila kubwa you. It won't come to suck your, your wound. It's only uh, that fly that uh, is fond of you, literally. Uh, that will come and for uh, and suck your, your your wound. So in kwa gala many people in the diaspora who speak a lot uh, about what's going on, bogera kubanga bagala nci away. They are proud uh, of of Uganda. So baja 
nga mwami bakasara bwa gambi bwa fune chiziwa about his family members the people we interact with on a daily basis are the people we work with right so mr bakasara who is in the federal government of the us who works in the federal government within some of the uh, the sections of the the, the 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 federal government of the usa his immediate friends are those people that he works with on a daily basis he spends much more time with them than he even spends with his family so when he's having conversations when you're having conversations at work we have personal conversations sometimes we have work conversations but the way we become productive the way we produce what we produce is because we also talk about our personal lives that's how we connect that's how we become effective uh, in our workplaces and if i am talking to my work colleague and tell them about uganda how is uganda this is what is happening and this is how the government is behaving my friend might even have more chips on his shoulders when my friend goes and talks to biden or whoever they have the influencer in that community guess what they are going to talk about henry nyangambi what ne what chobola ba yagala taking a time off die but to be uganda nga agenda nga anonyo mitegera so if you want a good report about uganda do your part and do the right thing build the country that you want to be portrayed and i think this is where the issue of how people in the diaspora are being treated should be looked at very critically by the legislators of our country and the policy makers think about how the policies that you draft affect the people on the ground how a street level bureaucrats interacting with these policies and how are they affecting them for example who were the people from the diaspora who were consulted when the dual citizenship policy or act was being drafted if that room did not have any voices from the diaspora how could the people who were not in the diaspora explain or interpret our life experiences about our tali mu diaspora about together about experiences is a physical tali living these are the things we want to talk about we spend over i think the diaspora spends over 3 million uh what 3 billion dollars a year spending send, sending it to uganda either through uh micro uh, uh helping family friends or through big investments so you you still want us to be part of uganda if you still want us to be part of uganda think about the policies you 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 are you're drafting and i know this uh, this policy has been around since 2009 i believe uh, but now that this the implementation we need to talk about the implementation we probably need to revisit these conversations because wh while you have so many people saying that everything you are doing is in the best interest of the people in the diaspora is it, are we in agreement of what you guys are saying my spokesperson ever moy aboge aboge abantu abira mu diaspora how long have they been living in the diaspora if they are living in the diaspora now right we, we we don't just need a desk a diaspora desk in a, in a consulate or embassy we need to be equal stakeholders but i i'm not the one uh, uh, I, i i want to give an opportunity to the to the two panelists uh, this is the reason i have only diasporas on this uh, on this conversation because i, I feel like the, the 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 voices of the diasporanians need to to go straight to the policy makers in Uganda Mr uh Mitala Muzukuru wa Muswangali you are a lawyer uh I don't know if you have read the act but I uh, I believe you have uh what are your thoughts on on this conversation as we proceed Thanks Henry um 
I don't want to adopt a very legalistic approach. I want to be a little bit more practical, you know, uh, to look at the, the, the practical issue that we are faced with. Yes, in terms of the law, I'm very familiar with the law. I've, I've, it's not the first time I'm coming across it. I think uh, there was a time when uh, the issue of uh, dual citizenship became a very hot subject here, here in, the United, in, the, in the United Kingdom. But I think, uh, I think they were encouraging people to register for dual citizenship. And I think uh, the embassy, the Ugandan embassy, the Ugandan consulate here went out full scale to try to encourage people. They run lots of uh, focus groups and uh, consultations. Well, no consultations, but they had a little bit of dialogue between here and there, encouraging people to go and register for dual citizenship and so on and so forth. And I know a number of people, some of whom are my personal friends, who went through that process. So I'm, since that time, I've kind of been familiar you know, with that kind of process, although not to the detail that I bring to the table today. So I think both of you do raise uh, very, you know, pertinent issues there. We are hearing, we're hearing concepts like uh, consultations, dialogue, policy initiatives, and so on and so forth. And uh, the question is, what's the role of the diaspora people in all this? Where are, where are their voices and how, how accurately have their voices, their aspirations, their interests, how have those been taken into account when some of these policies have been brought to the board? So those are really very, very critical, critical issues. But before I delve, uh, before I delve into that, I want to reference, you know, the the, the, the videos that uh, you played, you know, for the audience and for and for ourselves, you know, to set to set the debate, to set to set the context. I think for me, from what I see there, is uh, is what I refer to as the pulse of the nation. If you really want to 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 understand, if you want to to gauge uh you know, the atmosphere the correct atmosphere pertaining in the country or actually in any community i think it's best that you go and speak to the people at the grassroots because these are the people who really get to feel the actual effects of these policy initiatives when they are being applied it's not i i don't think that those who are privileged and when i say privileged people who sit in uh high-end profile offices, people who don't visit downtown, people who drive in, uh, you know, um, uh, those nice cushioned Range Rovers and so forth and so on and so forth. I don't think they feel the effects of the desperation as much as the rest of the Wanainchi, the people on the grassroots who have to fend for themselves, looking for food for today and tomorrow. So I think uh, that's why I refer to those conversations as the pulse of the nation. And they are very instructive in making us understand how desperate things have become over the years. Um, the Americans, they set their constitution, the entire narrative, they set it around the concept of the pursuit of happiness, you know? And I think, uh, you know, you need to ask a typical Ugandan, all of us are in pursuit of the same thing. We are all in pursuit of happiness. How many Ugandans are happy? Maybe that's the very subjective question to ask because happiness, you know, can be defined, you know, on, on so many parameters. But I, but I think that's really the gist of the point I'm trying to make is that that pursuit of happiness, the, the, the pursuit, the, 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 sheer, the sheer ability, the confidence for you to go out and, 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 and work for your sweat and be able to, to, to believe that you get something out of it, which also you can also be able to bequeath, maybe to your to your dependents or your offsprings or your the people you leave behind after you've gone. I mean, how 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 are we doing in that respect in terms of you know gauging how, what what sort of progress we are making? We all do have relatives. I mean, uh, you you just have to you, you just need to speak to people randomly, and and people will tell you there are so many people who are desperate. Actually, people are trying to escape. Uh, what has now become almost a danger zone for them, at least economically speaking, what has become a danger zone for them, where survival really has, has now become an issue of, of, of life and death, you know? So, so, so that is really important. So the question that I would ask myself is that, you know, the people who negotiated our independence in 1962, what did they have in mind? What did they envision? And if we benchmark, how much progress have we made towards attaining those those visions of, uh, of, the, of the people who who negotiated our independence for me as somebody from from uh, from, from a legal background you know what some of the things that are really crucial for me are things like uh, 
you know, justice and fairness, you know, equality of, 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 of all of us, you know, before the eyes of the law, you know. If you, if, if, if that, that, that kind of uh, uniform application of the law is something that really bothers me and concerns me a lot. I think uh, you, you see lots of things coming up from that side and it's just very difficult for you to justify them. It's just very difficult for you to justify them. You really ask yourself, the people who are behind these sorts of things, what is their state of mind, you know? As a mental health lawyer, that definitely comes to my mind. What is their state of mind, you know? Because your mind has to be sick, you know, for you to, 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 to engage into something that you clearly, that everybody can clearly see that it's unlawful, that it's illegal. And you, 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 you continue to pursue it like there is no consequence. I think I've described our current state of affairs to the effect that uh, we possibly have this, this, the soul of the nation is sick. And I think we need redemption. And I'm using those two words, the sickness of the soul and redemption, I'm using them purposefully because that's exactly where we are. That's the problem. And uh, we need that redemption. Um, Albert has, has, has hinted on a number of things there which I, I just want to to say that I agree with him. You know, I mean, we the diasporans. I mean, let's let, let's try to deconstruct this this concept of the diaspora. Who is the diaspora really? What does the term diaspora mean? What what is what is the definition of the term diaspora? You know, from my research, I've come up with a definition that was given by a chap called Gabriel Schaeffer. Uh, he said that those ethnic minority groups, groups of migrant people, you know, residing or acting in a host country, but maintaining strong sentiments and link with their countries of origins. They are the people who become to be defined as migrants. And African, you know, Uganda, lots of people in Uganda always want to reference this, 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 this concept of pan-Africanism. Even, even the African Union, you know, has, a, has, has something to say about, uh, you know, the African Union diaspora agenda which says people of African origin living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and they are willing to contribute to the development of the, of the continent. That's the description of who the diaspora are. There has been an evolution of the concept of diaspora, because previously people have always looked at us with, 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 uh, with the despise, you know. That term, Kubacheyo, the description of that term was meant to despise people, you know. But I think diaspora has evolved from that into highly very skilled people, you know, who have got a lot of opportunities and potential that if our home countries, if our home governments invest their effort and energy in good faith in the people in the diaspora, I think there is a lot that can be, you know, gained from that, you know. We are the face within which, with the, the image I portray about myself, Henry, Albert, the image, anybody living in the diaspora, the image that you cast there and portray to these people that, that we meet on a day-to-day -day basis tells a lot about the country, Uganda, much more than the billions and billions of US dollars that are invested to go into these, uh, you know, Dubai uh, ex ex expos and so on and so forth, you know. I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw somebody, a so-called consultant at the Dubai Expo. Somebody, I think, from a, uh, from from a background that was not African, but that was not Ugandan, if I should put it that way. Speaking on behalf of the Ugandans in the diaspora, and he couldn't even, you know, he he couldn't even explain what the country has to offer, other than saying that we have the equator. Is that the best that we can do as a country, really? Are there no people in the diaspora who can do? I mean, if you gave me an opportunity to speak for Uganda before an audience, I can bet you, without script, I can find something that can hit the internet and produce millions and millions of hits. So, so, Mr. Utela so, was doing a great job last weekend. Uh, so, so, speaking about Uganda and what, what what it has to offer, good the thing the good things it, it has to offer. But like when, when you reference that, uh, I think is uh, is a uh, gentleman from India, because I could uh, I could detect from uh, his accent, of course, mm. uh, that uh, uh, he might be, he might be speaking for Uganda right now, but uh, his uh, roots are probably from uh, somewhere 
Uh, well, uh, my, my judgment is that the job wasn't good enough. It was. It wasn't I don't think good. it was. Yeah. But 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 I think that that is really the the, the context of uh, of this conversation. That you know there are lots of opportunities. You know, uh, people in the diaspora they they involve themselves in businesses, in trade, in tourism. They contribute towards poverty alleviation schemes. They contribute towards the foreign direct investment, these are things, they are no brainers, everybody knows that, you know, even speaking about the, these sorts of things like this looks like you're just cramming, you know, st stuff that you've come across on the internet, but th th there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no genius here, you know, I think, uh, for me, I always want to, to, to believe that the people who are in charge of our affairs, they lack good faith, and whenever you do something in bad faith, the chances are that you're gonna get it wrong, you know? Because for instance, as Henry, you asked the question that, you know, where are the voices of the diaspora people? For instance, in, 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 the, in, the, in the policy that we are going to be discussing today about, uh, you know, these, these visa requirements for, for, for indigenous Ugandans going back home, you know, you need to produce A, B, C, D, you know? Fair enough, and we'll look at that when it comes to that. But I think Henry did ask a very fundamental question there and said, where is the voice of how? Because from what I remember, there was, uh, there was a World Bank forum that took place in, in Washington around November, I think November 2007, uh, which, which in that forum, I think the World Bank was trying to engage with, with various stakeholders, governments, non-government organizations, and so many other you know, entities, trying to encourage governments from different places to come up, to create environments, you know, to create environments that enable immigrant communities to be able to to, to participate in in, uh, in 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 positive positive initiatives back in their home countries the, so the incentives there need to be the there need to be incentives good incentives that can get somebody to be to say that okay what am i giving up in in return for what so where we have those elements of and i'm not saying it's what it is but apparent it, it does appear like that there is an element of bad faith when some of these policies are being constructed. And because there is that apparent, you know, bad faith in the way policies are designed and the way they are implemented, it, it, it kind of creates a, a problem of, of the legitimacy of those kind of policies. And when we say legitimacy, you know, we're talking about a failure to take into account what is the impact, you know, of the policy that you're going to implement, what is the impact on the a target group of people so 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 for me so for me that's what i would say so am i happy with the 59 years of independence in uganda it's a question of yes and no i'm happy that uh, we celebrate independence but we also need to ask the question that what are we really celebrating you know are we really independent when uh, we still have situations where uh, people still arrest members of parliament in a criminal in a blatantly kind of criminal kind of fashion, you know, are we are we are we are we independent when uh, you, you 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 can be arrested for no apparent reason, you know, and you are kept in in, in jail or in a police cell for more than forty eight hours, which is guaranteed by our constitution. Are we independent then? Because those are the things about justice. You know the protection of of civil liberties, people's people's liberties, the free trial, free, free and fair trial. That if, if something goes wrong, you should have the confidence that okay, I'll be put before a competent court, which shall judge me on the basis of the of the evidence is available. And if I'm found guilty, then I'll be convicted. But you would have gone through due process. And I think in a lot of things that we tend to see, there is that lack of due process, which creates lots of problems you know for, for for many of us so for for me that, that that is the angle from which i see these sorts of things this is a lot of content a lot of content uh that we need to uh digest uh delve into uh try to analyze and see how uh mommy bakasara talked about his roots uh being uh from toro uh and uh, the fact that Toro is the pearl of the pearl of Africa, which I like, I like that. Uh, when I heard this statement, all that came to mind was that 
I could be carrying a Canadian passport and I may not have a Ugandan passport for that matter. Naye in Sigala and Musaja Muganda, Sigala and Zesali Sechtoriko, Muzukuruwa Mugema. Aina attachment, Angamami Mitala wa Gambi. Dimbera Mudaspora Nenga, ni attachments, Wajemba. I am a source, I'm a Canadian. Uh, nina Canadian passport uh, na ye nsigala ndi musajja muganda rulimi ndutegera uh, bajaja wangemba manyi amataka gafe uh, manyuwe gali bulili mu manyuwe lili omuntu wajja na ngamba antino oloku wanga tocha toyina kataboka ka Uganda uh, oyino kubera ngo ina dual citizenship kubera ngo cha ina attachment ku Uganda what comes to your mind, especially when the, the law specifically states very clearly uh, that every person born in Uganda is a citizen. Every person whose parents or grandparents is or was a member of the indigenous communities existing and residing within the borders of Uganda. As at the first day of February 1926 and set out in the third schedule of the constitution of Uganda in article 10A of the constitution. If that person who was born in Uganda is therefore a, a citizen of Uganda. Olokubanga could take passport here Canada. Chitegeza chi ntino nina kusoka okubika minga reattached to Uganda. I have to make a registration. Ngato on ugwake nyini gonga amit every person born in Uganda. Even though when we look at the constitution, they come back uh, and tell us in... Uh, uh, in article, uh, article 13, I think, citizenship by nationalization, citizenship by uh, uh, prohibition of dual citizenship, I think. In the, prohib in the prohibition of dual citizenship, here they say that uh, subject to this article, uh, it is Article 15 of the Constitution, a Ugandan citizen shall hold another country uh, concurrently with his or her Ugandan citizenship. Uh, they go ahead and also say uh, that a citizen of Uganda shall cease forthwith to be a citizen of Uganda if on attaining the age of 18 years, he or she by voluntary act other than marriage acquires or retains the citizenship of a country other than Uganda. And a citizen of Uganda shall cease forthwith to be a citizen of Uganda if on attaining the age of 18 years, he or she by voluntary act other than marriage acquires or retains the citizenship of another uh, of, a, of a country other than Uganda. I know Bakasara, you are not a lawyer, but you are an MBA. I, I don't know what you understand by that. What um, can you tell Ugandans regarding that? What so, does that mean? And I do do I so do, 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 I, do I have Proceed, proceed, sorry. No, it's okay, go ahead. No, what 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 I can say regarding this law, and yes, uh, it is it is true I'm not a lawyer, uh, but some of these things you don't need to be a lawyer to, to interpret. <laughs> and I'm not by any means uh, minimizing uh, the important work that Julius and, and others do. But 
they don't practice a different language. Uh, these things are written in plain English. And we also have examples elsewhere to look at. So I can only abuse what our land friend, uh, friends did in, in, in that parliament in enacting that act as either misinformed or trying to do this, the, 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 the copy and paste that our leaders are so used to. And I'm not saying this to demean our, our leaders. Some of them are now in, in, in elders. Uh, I'm talking about the group that uh, uh, did this law in 2012. And some of them are learned. But being learned and being a lawyer and being in parliament does not really uh, mean that somehow you completely understand these issues or you even foresee the impact that Julius talked about. So I attribute that to just being this job that we keep doing of copying these things, but never really copying the guidelines that come with it. It's like buying a brand new car and never really getting that money with it. And we do that quite often in our African countries. The law that was enacted in 2012 cannot be constitutional. It cannot, as you explained it. It's just that Ugandans have been drinking from a fire hose and no one among us in the diaspora have had the time or the resources or even the commitment to actually go challenge that law in the constitutional courts, even in Uganda. Why is it not constitutional? Well, first of all, an act of parliament contradicts a right that is enshrined in the constitution. That's just unconstitutional. As a matter of fact, if I can make a comparison to the US immigration law, and why do I make the, 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 the comparison? Because really, most of our laws are from the English law, the Tort and Criminal Act. And the US, just like Uganda, also copied their laws from the English laws and just made some adjustments here and there. So if we don't understand these laws, why not go and look at these um, uh, laws where these things are derived from, originated from? But I don't think our friends did that. They just wanted to do an act. For example, in the US, the 14th Amendment and the process that makes you uh, a citizen. It says, just like in Uganda, so they kind of copy the, the language, but not entire, entirely or even understand how the US does it or the UK does it. It says if you are born in these borders, for example, in the US, if you're born in these borders and you are a US citizen, you are a US citizen by birth. And I know you guys have heard this argument made by our politicians and leaders from Uganda. They said, oh, no, no, when you took up Canadian citizenship, especially for us in the US here, they said, when you took up the US citizenship, it required you to renounce Ugandan citizenship. They're half correct. The US law of naturalization, the natural immigration and naturalization act requires foreigners who become American citizens to renounce citizenship and pledge allegiance to the US. It is true. However, it does not require the same for a natural born American. If you're born here, my son, if my son today wants to become a Ugandan citizen, the U.S. Does, has no impediments on him because they first value the constitutional right in the 14th Amendment. They exactly. cannot. It actually says Congress or anyone cannot make a law that strips off that, that uh, disenfranchises the rights that are enshrined in that 14th Amendment for my son. The same Somebody thing with Canada. Somebody from Kenya yeah. and they want to become, yeah. that's a different process. So in other words, mm -hmm. it's, 
if Uganda wanted to copy or if they had copied these English laws and they actually had brought the money that, and guidelines that came with it, they should have recognized that. That you cannot take Albert Bakasara's rights away because they are enshrined in the, in the Odochi Constitution of 1995. So in the 2012, they should have made a law, and they, they did, but it should only have catered to the Rwandese refugees, the Congolese refugees, the, the, the South Sudanese refugees who are entering the country. Say, hey, you guys want to become citizens of Uganda? Renounce your... You can't be Ugandan and Sudanese. That's understandable. Okay? Because they are naturalized citizens, just like the U.S. does. But you cannot take away a right that is, is, is enshrined in the Constitution. Those people who are coming in, who want to become Ugandan, don't have that right. They were not born in Uganda. Let's talk about the impact that Julius talked about. The impact is huge. And again, the arguments from our leaders in Uganda is that, oh, you guys in the diaspora, you're the ones who asked for dual citizenship. Yeah. But after that, we were never at the table to discuss the implementation of those, of that act. So now we are in here where the government has started looking at us. And I'm going to say this as a security threat. It's really yeah. all the commotion that is going on now. It's just that the government has changed its the way it views us. We're no longer now an asset. Okay? All eyes now are towards the East. They're looking at China with this cheap money and stuff. Of course, we'll pay a price. Our children will pay a price years down the road. So now... We have studied, our kids are studied, we're in the US, we're in Canada, we're everywhere, we're becoming affluent. And our people in Uganda are looking at us as a threat instead of an asset. So it's that it's that change that is requiring these things now. You have to register, you have to do what? Yeah. And, and these laws that they're bringing. But they're going to have a negative impact on our relationship with our motherland they are going to alienate us and they're going to alienate our children from uganda and again this goes into the conversation that we started with how do you do that to me and expect me to be a good ambassador of my motherland i want right yes. not because i don't love uganda it's just that the narrative that i will be giving will be coming from that personal perspective so, again, we, as a group, as leaders in the diaspora, as community activists, we have to somehow figure out a way to start talking to these people. And maybe, forcefully, if we have to demonstrate, they say that demonstrations matter, but they do matter. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking about them. <laughs> if we have to talk to uh, uh, petition our uh, host countries to, to, to interact to, with Uganda on our behalf, we need to, because these things are impactful. And first of all, the laws, the law, the law itself is incomplete and was done haphazardly. For example, before I came to the United States of America, I owned property in Toro. Part of it was hereditary. Part of it I had bought with my own money. So if I don't decide to become a natural, uh, uh, to, to do the process that they're forcing me to do to, 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 to become a dual citizenship, suppose I don't want to be a dual citizen. Who, who, what happens to my property? Because exactly. the law in 2012 took away my rights to become a Ugandan or to remain a Ugandan, but it did not take away my rights to own property in Uganda. And it might, if it took away my rights to own the property in Uganda, it never catered for the property that I already owned. Right. Because even in Amin's time, I mean, I, when, when Amin just started Indians, there was actually a board. I think it's still there. The, the Departed Asians uh, Property Custodian Board. Right. 
to kind of govern the the the, 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 <laughs> the properties of the Property. mother, uh, yeah. of those groups and things like that. So what, what is there to cater for for Albert Bakasara's property if he does not want to become uh, a dual citizen? Right. So these are the matters that we have to discuss with the policymakers in Uganda. Yes, I'm not a lawyer, but like I said, these are not really complicated matters. Some of them are so basic that even they, men, men and women can understand the selfishness of looking at us now as a security threat because somehow we are becoming more affluent, we are no longer on Kubakeios, and now we might actually be, have access to some power, uh, levels of power. It's, it's just short-sighted on behalf of our leaders. It's short-sighted because the millions and millions and millions of dollars that uh, and, and uh, ten pounds and all that we're sending to Uganda is actually helping the government. The services we're providing, the businesses we're supporting, the education, the systems, and, and paying school fees, and all that is actually helping grow the country. So for somebody to just want to antagonize that system, just to stay in power, looking at you know, being fearful of your own shadow and that kind of stuff, is really short-sighted. The government should continue, as it had for many, many years, to look us at us as an asset, put in place mechanisms that uh, work for all, both of us. We should have this right. relationship of mutual respect, mutual respect, benefit. Yeah. So uh, that's my perspective on, on, on this the immigration law. And, and, and um, that's yeah, changing you by ask... the hour, by the way, because I recently heard that now the fees have been reduced from... Hmm? 400 to 200. Yeah, that, no, that fees have been. Oh, no, no, no. You guys complain now. It's, instead of $400, you can pay $200. Yeah, no, oh, you can pay $200. Maybe don't want to pay 200 but... And some of us have reasons it... why we don't do that. Yeah, exactly. I think on your new devil, you can't get to the Chamate Cage. You can't get to the Chamate Cage. You can't get to the Chamate Cage. You swear allegiance uh, to, to your new country. But on the Canada, you Obo mu America, ni baba sasa ngayazali ba mu America, omuto yazali ba mu America ba mu Canada, ba sala wakufuna citizenship ya nsendal. He does not cease to be a citizen of Canada or the U.S. by birth. That is something that Uganda legislators need to look at. Nze passport yangu ni wakwa dem kutepa katavuka Canada. Egamba boni ni mengo Uganda. There is a it says born in Mengo, Uganda. Yes. Why why would I need Mine as well. why, exactly why would I would Mine I need well to register to become a, a citizen by registration? I was born in Mengo, Uganda. Even my Canadian passport recognizes it. Passport here, in fact, never did such a visa queen get a Uganda. Kubanga passport here, Canada, Jen Kutengamba, born in Mengo, Uganda. Citizen by birth, you can't strip that away. You can't. How do you strip that away from me? Nonga matiateka tim becoming a citizen by registration. What do you mean by that? What does that mean? Nga amateka geni ni go referencing nga gagamba. Nti omana bobanga tata o wajaja o yali citizen of one of those uh was a member of those indigenous communities. Indigenous being the key word, communities. Omwana wo, nzinewe maza do omwana wano, automatically ina kubeda muna Uganda, kubanga nzinazali wa Uganda, nembela yo more than 10 years. Atele ba jaje wange, bazali wa Uganda, netata wange, bazali wa Uganda. My child by default should be, kati omwana wa, o, 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 omwana wa, omwana, nakasatwe. Omwana wa, wa muzukuru wanga zali do wano. Yata ina kubela muna Uganda. Na ene muzukuru wange. Aina kubela muchi. Muna Uganda baba ya gala. Because of me and my dad. Chitegera. Because of his dad and me kwanze mbeda grand. Chiko maku grand according to the law. So chitegeza muzukuru wange. Yata ina kubela chi. Actually mutewa ni wa muzukuru wange. Yata ina kubela muna Uganda. According to the law. 
Right? Kati ubanga amba batia antino onze ya zari wa Uganda ate I register to become a Ugandan by registration? What does that mean? If they are, they are, they are willing to strip away my citizenship by birth, what's going to happen to, to, to my citizenship by registration? How easy is it going to be for them uh, to, uh, to, to, to strip it away from me? Ma, ma, ma Mitala, your response to Mr. Bakasara's uh, submission. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge my limitation on this subject, that uh, I, am not an, I am not a constitutional expert. You know? I think uh, these matters, because of the nature of what they are as constitutional issues, I think they need to go back to very good experts in this area. And I think uh, Albert has raised an issue there that perhaps it's about time that uh, somebody should think about you know, challenging some of these you know, legislations in a court of law so that we can get clarity on that matter because I think it looks like uh, there is an injustice that has been done or there is an injustice that's being committed. Uh, but, you know, it still sits on the law. And as long as it still sits on the law, then the, the only duty you have is to comply with the law. Otherwise, you, you find yourself, you know, operating in, a, in an unlawful kind of uh, illegal fashion, which is not which is kind of counter counterproductive to you as an individual. So there, there, there is that issue. But you see, I think there is two issues here. There is the issue of citizenship, and then there is the issue of immigration control. And I think those need to be addressed separately. In terms of citizenship, yes, I can see the inconsistency in the law. Unfortunately, you know, if you follow the rules of you know, legal interpretation. If you're reading the constitution, you're reading it from up down, you know, clause by clause, article by article, yeah. So you look at article 10, which specifies uh, on, this, on, on the specification of the indigenous Ugandans, uh, somebody who is born indigenous in Uganda is a citizen. And, uh, you know, that is something that is would be very awkward for somebody to suggest that they are taking it away for whatever reason. And then you proceed, you know, down the sequence. There are so many other, other other provisions in there, and I think it's the loss of citizenship, which is, uh, uh, I think, and I think that loss of citizenship, in my in my understanding, if if I put it and run it through my head, my understanding is that it should apply to loss of citizenship that has been obtained by registration, not of, not not loss of citizenship, which is acquired by birth. By, by somebody who is an indigenous Ugandan, because that is who I am. And are you saying that, you know, I'm no longer Ugandan? And I think this is this is a very, it's a hot subject. And I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to appear to bring in, you know, views that are rather uninformed, because I think we need to approach this subject very objectively as, uh, as, 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 as knowledgeable people and be able to, to provide, you know, answers and guidance for those who might find themselves in this kind of predicament. But in principle, as a person, yes, I do have it. I do have all reservations, you know. Um, I've seen situations in, uh, I think I remember, I remember a woman here. Um, but it's common to find, you know, British people here who, don't, who do not have passports. And because of the, the, the environment we, we find ourselves in today, it's very possible to be rounded up and you become an illegal you know, stay in the country because there is no document that talks about you. But people, there are people who are born here and they don't have a wish or a desire to travel anywhere. They don't wish to go on holiday. They, they, they are people who are just doing their stuff here. They don't travel anywhere else. And therefore, there is no need for them to have a passport on them. And there's no requirement for them to, apply, to acquire a passport or anything like that or any form of documentation that kind of specifies what their nationality is. But then it's possible for you to find yourself in a situation and there has been a situation of that kind here where this girl actually she was born here her grandparents were british proper and she was raided up and uh, she was able to rectify that problem because she could point to a very old piece of legislation somewhere which pointed to the fact that her father was Br or her grandfather was british you know so 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 that 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 is now how the issue of uh, being an indigenous person comes into play I think the former Katiki of Buganda, Umwami uh, Owechiti Mulika, has talked extensively about this subject. You know, and I think I think people should now begin to get a little bit more interested in some of the things that he has said. 
Because sometimes people say wise things and we look away like we've not heard or because they do not impact on us in that material time. Only to wake up and realize that, oh, this is something that has got you know, far-reaching implications for lots of people. So they, 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 there is a problem there on the question of, uh, of citizenship. As I've said before, in the current sign, I mean, there, there are options, you know. Um, number one, I think it's, it's, it's a question of judgment. You weigh, uh, people now need to weigh for themselves. How do they want to navigate uh, this kind of awkward situation? Because for somebody might say, all right, okay, I've taken citizenship of another country. What do I really have to lose, you know? Um, I could go and do the registration and I become a dual citizen and then, uh, you know, life goes on. I don't really care. Somebody might take issue with the fact that as, 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 as we are taking issue here to the fact that, you know, there is something there that strips away your, your citizenship at birth. That, that doesn't sit well anywhere. But as I said, I think uh, it might be helpful if maybe this matter, you know, is now litigated in the constitutional court so that we can get some very clear guidance on that, some clear guidance and clarity so that that matter can be settled. What I find to be interesting is that our constitution tends to be a quite more prohibitive in most of the things that it says. It says, you shall not do this, so and so shall not do this. So, I mean, I'll give you an example of uh, the, 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 the provision on the, on the cultural leaders. It says to them that, you, I, I, think, I think a cultural, is, is, you find provisions on a cultural leader where they say, a cultural leader shall not do a b c d i think it should have been better if it's the other way around if you specify exactly what a cultural leader can do rather than specifying what they cannot do i think that that, that, that for me that would be a more kind of attractive and more reasonable kind of approach than this uh, prohibitive approach that we have in our constitutional document that seems to prohibit almost everything you will not do this you will not do this you it, it's it's kind of too pres prescriptive and i find it quite uh, difficult to, to reconcile myself to that kind of situation on the other hand and i think this is really the gist of the matter which is causing now a lot of anxiety uh the requirement that uh if you are so for instance henry if you are a canadian citizen as you are despite the fact that you are an indigenous ugandan if you need to visit home you need to obtain a series of uh, permissions including requesting for uh, uh is it is it, is it a, 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 a an advance uh, letter of somebody re invitation an invitation later. yeah somebody inviting you to go back to your home country that is uh, as, as ridiculous as we can get for me where i want to look at it i want to look at uh, I'm, I'm going to apply now the legalistic approach here because i think you need when, when you assess these sorts of things first of all you need to ask the question is it, is it lawful as in the sense that is that provision or is that requirement based on a lawful you know parliamentary act a law, 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 lawful an act of parliament that has been passed through parliament you know, follow the due procedures and so on and so forth so is there a law that specifies that in order for you to come into the country uh, the act says you have to have a b c d because these are policies mind you obviously the law gives the the the, the, the minister or secretary of state to to make regulations and policies and so many other administrative measures that uh, enable them to manage and administer you know uh, a certain program so so that's the question number one that we need to find out is, is is that is that policy or is that provision is it based on a lawful parliamentary act i'm hoping that it is the second question we would be asking ourselves that is it necessary the the, the, the issue of necessity now comes in you know is it necessary and what kind of object what, what objective is being sought after what is the objective behind that policy initiative what does it achieve so it's the question of necessity there that needs to be to be answered and this is what this is why i want people who are behind these kind of policies you know, so that they shouldn't hide behind their desks and computers they should be able to come out and engage the general public you know these are kind of uh, issues of legitimate public interest they should come and give an explanation what are they trying to achieve what are what are the sorts of discussions that have you know 
against which this kind of policy measures have been implemented. You know, so there is that question, the question of lawfulness, there's the question of uh, uh, necessity. And of course, there's, there's, there's the question of uh, proportionality, you know, is it proportionate, the application of the, of the policy, is it proportionate? Now, when you talk about proportionate, you need to, you, you, you need, you need to, to judge, you need to make a judgment. Who does it affect? And what is the implication? Now, this is where it gets very controversial. And uh, okay, because you, you, when, when you look at the, the, the application of this policy, you know, in fairness, it's not being targeted towards people in the diaspora, strictly Ugandans in the diaspora. I think the policy is being targeted generally towards anybody who requires a visa to visit Uganda, whether they are Kenyan, whether they are uh, British, whether they, whether they are Americans, wherever they are, as long as that is who you are and you want to go home, that's that's one of the requirements. So I, I think from that point of view, I wouldn't say that uh, it, it, it is disproportionate or, it's dis or, or, or it is discriminatory, discriminatory in, in nature that it discriminates against people from in the, the diaspora, generally speaking. Now, this is, this is the application of the legal principles. I'm looking at those legal principles as I would apply them if I had to litigate that kind of issue. You see what I mean? Uh, so looking behind the policy, what, is, what does really the policy tend to achieve? And I want us really to benchmark here, you know. Um, a couple of days ago, I've been, I've, as, as the COVID situation improves, I've been thinking of going on holiday because I've not been on holiday for quite a long time. I've been thinking of going on holiday. And my, one of the things I was thinking about, before I learned about the death of my sister, I was thinking that maybe I should go and visit the US. I've never been to the US before, so I was thinking maybe I should go and visit the US. So I went onto their website and I had this in, in, in the back of, of what I was doing. And I went onto the American embassy website, uh, looked at uh, their visa requirements, there is a very lengthy form that you've got to complete. It's really lengthy. You know, it will take you almost about 30 minutes to complete, and you have to keep on saving it. Because if you don't save, it kind of freezes, and by the time you come back, you've lost all the information, you've got to restart again. But the form is complicated. And uh, it gets too bad to the point that it even requires you to provide your social media handles your twitter handle your facebook handle and any other social media platforms where you are active it requires you to complete a history of your working history for the last five years it requires you to state exactly who you are visiting in the united states if it's a hotel you need to provide all the information their address contact number or if i'm coming to visit a private individual like albert and you need to provide me with your phone number so that they have the phone number and so on so it's it's quite a, a bureaucratic process and i was comp and, I, and really i i i went there purposely because i wanted to benchmark on what we are being required as ugandans and what would other countries require us to do and i could see that uh, possibly what uganda is asking for is not as complex as what the United States is asking for. And this is my fair assessment. I'm, I'm trying to be as objective as I can be. Because honestly, and as uncomfortable as it seems, if I carry the British passport, and I don't, but if I did carry one and I wanted to visit home, and uh, I'm required to get an invitation later, how difficult is that to do? Why, why, why do you complicate your life so much to that extent? You get somebody at home, get a friend. If you're not getting a friend, book into a hotel, you know, indicate what you're going for. What's the purpose of your visit? You know, indicate what's the purpose of your visit. I'm coming for tourism. Get your visa, go home, do what you have to do. I mean, let, 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 but I, I, think, I think let us not allow these, these people who designed, for whatever bad intentions they have, for whatever bad faith they have behind their policies, let us not allow them to, 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 to impede on what we need to do, you know, for our own progress. I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm making sense here, and it's bound to, I'm playing the, the devil's advocate here. Because when you look at uh, current trends and issues in immigration, they, there's, they are, there are lots of problems, you know, there's uh, people traveling, people committing, you know, immigration fraud, traveling on uh, false identity, uh, you you got all sorts of people, terrorists, uh, people who are involved in terrorism, murderers, rapists who are running away from uh, places where they think you know they they, they they their time is up. 
and many of them have been have been finding themselves you know among the star among the star on people because of the the, the 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 lapses in immigration control i mean every other country does it even if you want to come to britain here today you would have to fill in you'd have to provide that information you need to record you, they they require you i mean yeah, people who are asking for visas to come to the uk or go, go to sweden or anywhere they will tell you the kind of nightmare they have to go through to provide bank statements you know with so much amount of money so to require a foreigner you know a an american a swedish or a swedish person a german person a jamaican person anybody to require them to provide some kind of uh, you know advanced information let, let us know who you are who are you what are you coming to do i think that is a legitimate i think i, I think for me that's a, it's, it's a legitimate request you know by the state now I, i'm saying this as somebody who is very critical of uh, right of, of most of the things that uh, you know people do <coughs> those domains but i said i also want to be a little bit objective so that you know we we, we, we can show people exactly what is the picture and what needs to be done i think for me that's the way i would look at that kind of and I'm, I'm 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 happy to be criticized you guys are happy to disagree with me yeah uh well the thing is it's not okay. disagreeing per se i think uh, you raise a very good point uh in that uh, you are contextualizing immigration control as opposed to citizenship, which are probably two different uh, dynamics or contexts uh, to, to evaluate here. Uh, I, I want to take this opportunity also to remind you that this conversation is not specifically about uh, immigration control for the country, for all other people who are intending to come to Uganda. This conversation is about indigenous Ugandans. And all the references that have been made have been based on the fact that we are discussing indigenous Ugandans going back uh, to Uganda. Omunta ina chitawe afude, mzei wanga afude, ngenda genda muziki, nene taga immigration, nchaba ino kuzika mzei, first and foremost, inokso kanefuna uh, invitation later, then going through the bureaucracy. Uh, do you think that's uh, desirable? Uh, the, the, the notion that a person who was born in Uganda has to renounce his citizenship uh, that is given to him through birth uh, by right. What they like, what are the implications of filling out that form requesting for another citizenship to, to that country that you already attached to because wazali wayo tata yazali wayo jaja yazali wayo abantu bonna bazali wayo bo connected nabo naye kakati mbo bagamba mbo lokubanga oyagala okujewafi by the way in most cases abamtu dayo na Uganda wa watu wagala kubuza ku bantu bafu which is the biggest uh, connection that we have there, our people, uh, besides the property and other things. Gokungamba, we are no longer Ugandan. Ngaba bo gera muchika, neva bala abana bata tawangi nange vante kamu. Ngaba bo bambala, bo 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 tuwa tuwa gera kubintu. Ebi kuata gana kukuchika. There are certain decisions the bata sabola kola. No applying in the same manner. we Canada, Uganda. we Uganda. Nange the same processes. This is all reference in the America. An American, regardless of whether they are carrying a Ugandan passport, they're not going to go through the same process. America Jaitamu. If they were born in America or, the, or, or Canada, they, the processes are different. There has to be a distinction between someone who is indigenous and someone who has been naturalized or someone who is uh, intending to visit, to, to be a tourist. I am not a tourist in Uganda. Spiritualist. Uh, Henry, 
Ugandan by birth. That's why the Canadian passport tells me. Are we? Are we? I get you very well. I just want to raise it. It's another kind of different. Uh, Lower. I know, but before you raise that, let, let yeah. me, Mr. Bakasara probably has his own uh, uh, response to you as well, Mr. Mr. Bakasara. Mr. Albert, please proceed. Uh, yes, Henry. So, uh, uh, and I appreciate, I appreciate uh, Julius playing. Can you hear me? Yeah, I appreciate Julius playing the devil's advocate and uh, looking at this from a purely uh, legal uh, perspective. And I agree. Compared to compared to uh, what the U.S. and other places ask, uh, Uganda's actual requirements are very, very uh, uh, few. But again, just as Henry is saying, and I think it was Henry who, who, who read uh, to us the uh, the Immigration Act. It actually, it actually had an exemption in there for marriages. So I'm leaning towards what Henry is saying, and that's what I have been saying. The impact. If we are Ugandans, born in Uganda, what is so hard to do an exemption for us and leave the other Chinese and then Cubans and whoever wants to visit Uganda, fill out that nice short form that you have made. Because part of it is the recognition of our contribution to our motherland. Part of it is appreciating us. And also, yeah, give us that to say, hey, these are people who have been instrumental in, in, in building this country. So we're going to make an exemption for them. Say, hey, you guys have this exemption because you, are, you were born in Uganda. So it doesn't matter whether you show up at, the, at, at, at Entebbe with a, an American passport or a Canadian passport. Give me some privileges. Give me something exactly. back. Exactly, yeah. For um, as a yeah, so I'm, I'm not disputing that we should apply for some of these. Some of these things are so easy, by the way. I think even the naturalization uh, uh, thing that we're talking about, the form is shorter than, and the process is very shorter than the one that the most countries, uh, uh, including the US, would have. But that's besides the point. The point it's is, also cheaper I mean, in Uganda. I Uganda, Uganda if you, have, if you, Yes, yes, yes. So I should not be, we should not keep having these false equivalents and or false comparisons of saying, oh, the, the, the immigration and naturalization form, form in the US is $1,200. The one for Uganda is now $200. What's your, why are you complaining, Albert? That's a false, <laughs> that's a false choice. Well, I'm complaining and I will be complaining even if the process was $0 and I just have to take the five minutes to fail it. I'll still complain because I'm born and raised in Toro. I'm a Ugandan. Yeah. And yeah. it's enshrined in the constitution that I'm a Ugandan. So I'd complain because of the basic principle of saying I'm a Ugandan. Why are you inconveniencing me to fill out a stupid form? Exactly. So that's where we're starting from. But I also want to impress upon you guys the other limitations. And I think these are the ones. I don't think the form form and the, the letter and where you're going to stay, those mattered much. Well, let me bring the elephant in the room. It's the land ownership matter. Right. Exactly. That has actually blown. It's, it's like the lights have went off once it went to the land ownership matter. Where they said, oh, you can't own, own land unless you <laughs> unless you are uh, uh, you have now become, you have applied and paid and become a dual citizen. You can't, uh, uh, um, actually even on the land, there's a different kind of land you can and cannot uh, own. My all of us is uh, uh, free, freehold. Uh, don't ask me the difference. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's those, when it comes to those kind of things, then we're no longer talking about 
the simple citizenship and immigration yeah. of, a, of, of a short form that Julius is talking about. Now you are encro encroaching on my inheritance. In country. Enough to remember a neighboring president in the early 90s who implored his countrymen who had left that country and said, This country is a very tiny country. Those of you who have made home elsewhere, please stay there. And, and, and I think you can uh, connect the dots and remember what happened to that president. So who said, yeah, this is a small country. You guys have made home in Uganda and in, in Kenya and everywhere else. Please stay there. <laughs> they did not stay there. <laughs> no, they, they came. They, they came they for him. Down. So, so, yes. so it's the same thing. I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that's what's going to happen to Uganda. But I guarantee you, if they are looking at us and looking at this thing as a security matter, we've got to now. Well, that is a possibility that Ugandans that you are eliminating are taking their land and. Uh, they may actually force their way back. Right. They may force their way back. Then you have a bigger Absolutely. security threat than the one that you tried to step Me to get. Yeah. Exactly. So these are yeah. things, and, and, and that's why I'm appreciating these conversations. So we talk about these things instead of taking that uh, uh, president attitude and that country's uh, eventual, eventuality that we also. We should talk about these things. No, you're not going to knock me out of Uganda. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. And when you do, for every action, there's a reaction. Indeed. And you're not going yeah. to take my land. So, uh, like I said, before I got to Uganda, to, to, to the US, I owned land that I, I worked. I worked with my sweat. Yeah. And those were not, those were not easy times. These guys that now have easy times. They can go and send them a deal and have ghost teachers and, and bank money. Those were sweat. Huh? That, those were not easy times in the early 90s, 80s. Those were not early, you know, good times. So I can't work that hard and buy my land and you say, oh, no, you cannot own my land. Well, I already own it. Or you cannot own freehold land. Well, I already own it. My father left it to me. So what do you want to do? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So those those are the things that we're talking about. Do an exemption for us that recognizes our constitutional rights enshrined in the Constitution of Uganda. And start looking at us as an asset for the betterment of the country. But we have been that. We have been doing that. We've contributed a lot. Also. Now we can talk about uh, even the, 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 the bail, uh, the issue that they're talking about. Yeah, be, be, before so we talk about the bail, do, do you want to give uh, Mr. Mittal an opportunity to respond to oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Because, yeah, because I was going to, to relate that to, to the copy and paste things that we, we do. In oh, Uganda. okay, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, uh, um, uh, yeah, Julius is talking about uh, the, uh, the, the American process being very, very lengthy. But guess what? If Julius had been born in the U.S., he wouldn't even have to fail to see that form. <laughs> no. Okay. As lengthy or as, as short as it is, there's no short or, or long form for an American citizen who had taken on Cuban uh, citizenship and stayed in Cuba for 20 years. If at one time he decided he wanted to get back to the United States, he just has to go in the, uh, in the, in the, in, in the big uh, bin, and, and dig up his passport and dust it off. And if it's expired, just has to go to the and say, hey, I need to renew my passport. And that's it. And come back. Mm. There's no reason for it. So it's the same right that we're asking. So instead of them keeping and copying and saying, oh, we want to be like the US, we want to be like, they should not copy and paste laws that they don't even understand how they work or why they are in place. The US mm. has that lengthy form primarily because of terrorism. No one has uh, uh, has been <laughs> affected by yeah. terrorism as, 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 as the U.S. So they have that. They want to know your social security, uh, security I and mean, your social media accounts. Media. They want to know everything. But there's no reason for Uganda to ask me about my WhatsApp account. Mm. Okay. The heightened level of terrorism that Uganda is protecting itself against is not equivalent. It cannot be equated to that of the U.S. Therefore, we should not do the same things. We should not even compare the same forms. 
if you don't need my WhatsApp account and the US guys, we should we should grant them that. So you know what? Those guys need your security. Uh, I mean your your uh, social media account, but we don't. Mm. Instead of copying these things, oh, the US is doing this, let's do it too. The US is doing this, let's do it. The UK is doing this, Canada is doing this, let's do it too. No, that's not how <laughs> our leaders should be <laughs> making these laws. That's not a good way to, 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 to legislate. Mm. We should do things that affect the Ugandans and, and, and us in the diaspora, diaspora, things that have the questions that you guys already asked. What is the impact? Mm. At the top of that, who is this law being written for? Who is it going to inconvenience? And what are yeah, what are the consequences? Mm. So I'll stop there. Go ahead, sir. Uh, very, 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 very interesting observations, Albert. And, and I entirely agree with you. I entirely agree with you. Absolutely. I think uh, I started off this conversation by saying that most of the things that uh, are done. You know, our country is a country full of is, is a country that's full of contradictions. You know, we are we are at contradiction with everything we do. People say this and they mean the other. You know, if we only had straight faces, you know, to 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 say what we say and we mean what we say, I think we would be so much in, in a better position. I think it, it in that in kind in that kind of environment, it, it it also encourages you know the the. the the, the grassroots, the local people, you know, to, to have confidence in what the, the, their leaders are doing because it's, it's taken in the best interest of the country, in the best interest of everyone, other than, uh, you know, taking decisions in the short term. They are really myopic, you know, and they are only meant to solve problems in the short term because you have a political problem here and you think the best way out of it is to legislate and put restrictions on other people or just make it hard. You know, for them to to have a livelihood, I think that that's not that's not a solution for the long term, and I don't think uh, it will serve us any 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 good purpose because it will be just a matter of time before even those who are behind, you know, designing these sorts of uh, you know policies and laws, they will also be they will also find themselves in the firing spot, you know, before it's too late. Before it's too late, I remember. Uh, you remember one of uh, one of the most prominent prime minister. I don't want to. I don't think it was well. I don't know whether it was one of the most prominent prime ministers we've ever had. But we had uh, a very influential prime minister until very recently, who, when he was in parliament as lead of government, he was very central, you know, to um, the enactment of the of, of that public public order management, you know, act, which became a very offensive act that has been applied, you know, for very, you know. Uh, insincere motives uh, for political purposes, you know, far beyond what was the intention behind that that, that, that that act. It was only meant to empower the police to be able to manage public public disorder. And it's now turned into a tool of political manipulation and political, you know, kind of uh, tactical manipulations. But I remember that gentleman when he was in parliament and members, people who, who saw uh, who looked ahead and they saw that they would, this, pro, this this law was not a good law that it would, it would cause problems for the country. He said he didn't really care because they had the numbers. But it was not too late before the same law that he had helped to enact, this, despite its ugliness, was used against him. And then I hope that at that point he began to see the wisdom of those who had been opposed, you know. Uh, to that law when it was being passed. So there is consequences. There is certainly consequences. For the avoidance of doubt, I just want to be very clear. You know, the issue of uh, being an indigenous, you know, citizen is without question. That's not given to me by anybody. It's not given to me by the government. It's not given to me. It's, it's who I am. It's a question of my, it's a question of my identity, really, you know. And I, I think for me, I'm grateful for the fact that, you know, even though in one respect, the constitution takes away your citizenship by, 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 by prohibiting you to hold dual citizenship of or citizenship of another country, which you would have voluntarily acquired, you know, out of your own volition. It, 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 prohibits, it, it puts a prohibition on that. But in the same, in the same strain, it goes back and gives you the opportunity to reclaim back that citizenship. Obviously, not at the same level as possibly what you would have had. 
And I think for me, the problem I sense there is that they, they, there is this uh, creation of a two-tier citizenship, if you see what I mean. Then you find yourself in a situation where you have people who are, uh, because they were your citizens before and they had to lose their citizenships and then because they have got to reapply again and uh, it, it really it puts, it puts us or it puts those who are concerned at the mercy of the state. Because, you know, whereas you cannot be stripped of your indigenous citizenship, you can be stripped of your citizenship by registration. The grounds are there, you know. There is no such provision for a stripping of citizenship, uh, indigenous citizenship. Uh, you know, somebody cannot do that. But if you are a registered citizen, a, a registered citizen, I think the grounds are very clear in the constitution that you can be stripped of that citizenship if the grounds pertain. So, so there is there is a problem there. My worry is that I really don't want us to, and I, I and I would hate us to be in a situation where we have a two tier kind of uh, two tier kind of citizenship. One is higher and the other one is less. I I I would really be uncomfortable with that. And I think uh, the, the, the 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 key thing should be is that if you are a citizen, you are a citizen. You are entitled to vote, you are entitled to own property, you are entitled to do whatever you want to do as a citizen of a country. And I think for me that, that's really crucial. It's, it's that one unique kind of area we, we, which, I, which I would like to be corrected. But certainly I do, I do get the concern. I do get the concern because it doesn't sit well really, you know. I, I, I've, been, I've been looking at my heritage here for obvious reasons, but I've been looking back through my, my great-grandparents, you know. Nkwanzi, Chironde, Matia, Lukindu, so on and so forth. I've been going back the line and reciting them because of something that happened in the family. I just wanted to kind of refresh my my understanding of our family lineage. What happens when something disastrous happens? How who do you go to? What what are what are the cultural what are the cultural lines that you've got to pursue to be able to make sure that things are being done in the correct you know in the in the correct approach. And I think that's where the idea of being an indigenous person comes from. I am Mitala because I am Mitala. You know, that's not that's not given. I do I don't owe that to anybody because I am who I am because I am who I am. And therefore, nobody, whether I hold a Ugandan passport, whether I hold whichever passport, nobody can wake up in the day and tell me that you are no longer a Mitala, you are so and so. I think that would be ridiculous and it's not desirable really. So uh, those concerns, I do get them. I think uh, it's crucial that uh, people in the diaspora should continue to speak with one voice uh, through these kind of conversations, through the various strong lobby organizations that we have, whether in America, whether, whether in, in Canada, whether in the UK, so that people in the diaspora can, can can come up with one voice. I think we are a force to reckon with, and I think it's no longer possible for the government to ignore people in the diaspora. If there was such a time when they thought that people in the diaspora didn't matter, I don't think that is possible any longer. Because of uh, uh, the, the, the sorts of knowledge, expertise, experience, and so many other domains in which people in the diaspora have become to be a central, a central focus. You know, uh, for for if if you dry, if you're looking at the, the issues of, of, of national development, you know, I think what's really um, what what is really unfortunate is that there seems to have been quite a lot of uh, of focus on enabling those who are at home. You know. Uh, to be able to to participate in uh, developmental programs that can encourage and drive economic progress for the country, which is all of us we are looking for. But it doesn't look to be that the same kind of focus has been applied to people in the diaspora. And, the, and th this is one of those areas. If you, we've already considered that, you know, a lot of money is sent back by, by Ugandans living abroad who contribute directly towards this program of poverty alleviation. I think the contribution of the diaspora people outstrips, you know, any kind of contribution that is made anywhere, whether in, in donations, whether in aid or whether in government, you know, uh, allocations. So I think uh, a group of people who have got a potential of that kind, it's really impossible to ignore them any longer. And I think if we do all speak with one voice, it's quite possible that we can we, we can get our, our, our views and... and uh, 
and our, and our sentiments properly, you know, articulated in this kind of policy policies and policy initiatives. Uh, I think uh, I think that that that's that that's what I would be saying on that end. Mr. Albert, any response to that? Can we proceed to, with, with other suggestions? Uh, there is a comment here on uh, uh, WhatsApp. Uh, sorry, on uh, Facebook, Mr. Henry Riombia is saying that it is so uh, surprising that the current government is proposing that uh, one is no longer a citizen after choosing to live in another country. Collective advocacy, including those uh, NRM or sympathizers, are, are needed. Uh, so th this law is actually a decade old. We are only starting to, uh, to yes, talk yes, about uh, it uh, now. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, we're, we're beginning to talk about it. We're beginning to talk about it. And, and especially, uh, uh, um, I know you introduced me as uh, uh, the, the former uh, deputy speaker of UNA, uh, of the UNA Council, and uh, Henry Luyombia is now the, the deputy speaker uh, of the UNA Council. So, UNA, and I'm bringing in UNA for obvious reasons because they, in 20, 2009 and uh, between 2007, and 2009 or 2011 there they were very active as a, a diaspora organization that advocated for dual citizenship but around that same time the organization also went through turmoil i think they broke off apart in, in 2014 and, and, and then the fights have never stopped uh, the, the guns have never <laughs> been put back in, in the whole system. So in 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 in, in that period, the community, the, the people who spe spearled that dual uh, citizenship advocacy, never went back or continued the pressure on the government when the government was writing implementation laws. So when this act is, yeah, you're, you're right. I think I believe it's the Immigration Act of 2012. I think that's the official name for it. Uh, I could be wrong, but but it, yeah, it, it's it's a decade old. So now is when some of these implementation uh, guidelines are coming up. The law is in place, but as uh, some of us who are familiar with how laws are made, the law really is very simple. It could even be a one-liner, but you have to go back and write uh, uh, statutes that 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 are underneath it, and it. Implementation uh, uh, procedures that are under, and that's for the most part, uh, if they're following the, the, the British and the American uh, legal system, that for the most part that is done by the executive. The law gives them that power to do that, and then they go ahead and do that. So some of the things, of, oh, you you have to do this, or you have to apply for a letter to come, or that kind of stuff, are not written in the constitution. But they, they have an enabling law that allows them to do these restrictive things. So that's really what I can say about that. It's just that the law is a decade old. It's just that we're tuning in because the executive now is pulling, putting in place these restrictive measures, or at least the one measures that we find restrictive, and we're all waking up saying, what? But yes. We were also the very people who asked for dual citizenship. Now, what form it came in is now the point of contention. I don't mind being a Ugandan citizen and an American citizen. But if being an American citizen means that Uganda strips me of my birthright, then we got a problem. And if it was okay, Okay to say it, and in those ten years, because we didn't know what that meant, so they had the law in the books. And like I said, we've been drinking from a fire hose in this in, in this government in Uganda that we don't even stop to think of like, what did the government say? What did the president say? I mean, and we can go on and on into other topics. I mean, look at what is happening. The president can actually wake up one day and say, schools are closed. Until oh, January. I dare Biden to say that in the U.S. I know. <laughs> I know. I dare Biden to, to, to do a press conference and say that in the U.S. We will riot. He has no right to say that. No. He has no right. But we are in a country that does that. 
where the president looks and say schools are closed until next January. year and and and, and 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 January and who knows how he arrived at January he could actually say in, until 2026 <laughs> exactly huh? yeah. so that's that's where we are in the, when when you're being faced with, with those kinds of stuff yeah. it's why 10 years later we're waking up to say oh my god this law is on the books and we think it's unconstitutional but mm -hmm. i have no doubt in my mind that this law is unconstitutional we just have to fight it but to fight it now that they have even put out some measures that show that they're going to encroach on our rights as as as, as, <laughs> as uganda born uh, uh, citizens of whatever country then we need that concerted effort that organization and uh, Yuna, uh, and I'm speaking to now to, to, to uh, uh, Mr. Riombia, Yuna can be part of this conversation. They were leaders in this conversation before. They can come. But we are no longer going to cede this space to organizations like Yuna by themselves, because now we have seen that they can lead, and then they can fall us apart, then they can go to sleep, and the consequences are going to affect us all. And to be yeah. fair, uh, and I've been part of you now for, uh, in leadership for a couple of years. And then uh, Henry Sally, you are part of it. And Henry Riombe is now part of it. We, we don't have our act together. OK? We don't have the trust of the, of, 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 of the community. We, we also have our own issues to, to sort out. So this is too important to see it to an organization that does not have complete trust of the community. Right. Okay? That's where I'll end. And I think we should also uh, invite the, 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 uh, the cultural institutions to engage in these conversations because yes. w w when they say that Mr. Bakasara yes. can no longer own property in Toro, mm. how does that sit with, with the Omukam of Toro? I know it's, it's, it's absurd because until December of this year, I was the chairman of Torah American Association. <laughs> so it's absurd. It's absurd <laughs> also. Like we, we were talking about I, I'm, son, I'm, I'm, I'm son, not sure. His name is, is Kahaya. So, I'm not sure whether I've seen right. And I'll, I so beg to be corrected. It's, it's, it's I'll, absurd. I'll, I'll, go back. I'll go back and check and see if uh, I read correctly. But I think I've seen somewhere within the constitutional provision that says that if somebody who is a Ugandan citizen loses their citizenship, uh, due to taking up citizenship of another country, and you know they do not necessarily lose ownership of property they have had, they would have acquired while they were Ugandans. So, say suppose today I'm a Ugandan and I acquire property, and then in two years' time I take citizenship of another country, I do not necessarily lose ownership of that property that I acquired before. I became a citizen. So I think that is something that will need, need to be looked at, you know. And, yeah, well, but where, where is this enshrined? Did you read the constitution? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I read it in the constitution. I've, I've been reading. Before we came on air, I was looking at uh, chapter 13. It isn't it's stipulated somewhere in chapter 13. No, chapter 3, rather, not chapter 13. It is, there is a provision it's there. Chapter, yeah, it's chapter, chapter 3, but I didn't yeah. see that myself. Uh, I didn't see anything pertaining to yes, property. But, but then, but then, you to, but then what happens if you want to sell that land or transfer it from yourself to uh, Mr. Henry? Oh, yeah. Uh, you yeah, can't there do is that something. because then you will, you, you, will need an, uh, you will need a national ID, but you can't have a national ID mm -hmm. if you don't have your citizenship. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think, a, a, I think a, a, it's an article. Yes, you can. I think... your, your property. Yeah. No, I'm saying your I property think... has, it was not taken away in the constitution. No. But in a way, it was taken away because you, it, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. Um, it, it wasn't spoken of. of. It wasn't spoken you of. You cannot sell when... it. Yeah, but the other laws, other laws have can, 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 uh, kind of speak for it. For example, you can yes. sell your land. You are not you can't. To give your land away because to do that, you need a national ID. Even to own land yeah. now, the, the, yeah. the, 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 land, the land act is very clear on that. That you know, no Ugandan can, can at least not, uh, uh, you can you can have a lease and so many other things around that, but not uh, you can't own land, 
can't hold freehold. You can't have freehold land. But I see the concerns of uh, of, of, of of all of us. It, 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 it affects all of us. If I give, suppose if I give my children property today, you know, possibly they would not be able to take ownership of that property because technically they are not Ugandans by virtue of the fact that they hold citizenship of another country, which I think is absurd. So, they so, are Ugandans. Yeah. They are Ugandans based on you and your dad. That's what the constitution says. Tata mm. wo. Wajajawo, Babanga in Uganda, Gavere Miaka Kumi from nineteen twenty six. That that I think that, that came that, in. that's what the constitution says, but then it goes yes. on further, but then it goes on down further to say that yeah. there is a prohibition on you holding dual citizenship. So this means that if my children take citizenship of another country, unless they register to restore their citizenship. Unless they register, they, they register to restore their Ugandan citizenship. They are not Ugandans. But here's the thing: this is another conversation that we need to have. My kids do, did not make that that decision for me to come here and uh, and pay a, uh, swear allegiance to the Queen to mm. become a Canadian citizen. Mm. I did it for myself. Never na bana benza de, because it's anali muna Uganda. Ne jaja we muna Uganda. But by by you know, city, Ugandan citizens by default, so they they should be they, they should be dual citizens by default. First, they are citizens, Canadian citizens by birth, but they are also Ugandan citizens by association through me and their granddad or grandparents. That is what Ugandans need to discuss now. They need to discuss these things. Banga ya gabo ugambia, wosala honti ugenda kuwa bana weta kari, wabaa property zo, wichi wichi wichi. Those kids should have access to that property without any kind of uh, encroachment by government. Mm. Ne waba te, 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 te basa vye gun citizenship by, by registration. Because when you ask for citizenship by registration, you are forfeiting your citizenship by birth. Definitely. Or by, definitely or by association through your uh, your grandparent or your and your and, and uh, that is where the key contention is that is it does it look fair is it reasonable is it right that you know i should lose my birthright because there is a piece of law somewhere that says that you know if you take citizenship of another country you are no longer citizens of this country i think that 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 doesn't sit right, and I agree with you entirely. That just doesn't sit right. It's complicated. It's a complicated conversation. We shall continue engaging in this conversation. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I can get someone from Uganda now who either sits in the in, in the legislative chambers or someone who is uh, a, a constitutional lawyer continue expounding on these conversations this is an important conversation that we need to continue having uh i am going to ask you for your closing remarks i think it's it's been two hours now uh it feels like it has been only 30 minutes for me <laughs> uh, Naye, what, what are your closing remarks i'm going to start with mr mitala your closing remarks uh, um, this conversation. closing remarks guys i wish you a lovely week ahead uh you know me. I always want to be, you know, even even in my even in my most sad moments, I always keep a smile on my face. You know, when when I sit here, somebody might not know, except if I've said it. Somebody may not know that uh, my sister died two days ago. So let's keep positive. There is nothing of this kind that is not uh, correctable. Um, I I, re I think there's a time when we are, we were talking here about the the, the great. 1900 you know buganda agreement which was showing us how this this, this now contentious issue of the buganda Milo land came to be and how the, the concept of the bataka and the Bakungu and so on how they came to own land and uh, other people's rights being uh, you know uh, taken over by another group of people i think one of the things that i remember coming from that conversation is that uh, you know the buganda refused to let go of that concept that defines them as Baganda. So, and despite whatever measures that have been employed 
for, 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 the, for the subsequent years. So many efforts have been taken to try to, 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 to dismantle people's spirit about their, you know, the, their identity of who they are as a yes. people. So this again is one of those questions. The, the question of identity goes really to the core of your existence as a human being. When you sleep, you know who you are. When you wake up, you know who you are. It's a question of identity. Nobody can take that away from you. But of course, there needs to be effort. There needs to be effort for everybody who is concerned with this issue. If there is an unfairness, if there is an injustice, it's just right that that injustice should be collectively fought and corrected using all the legal means available. That will be my word for the day. Thank you very much, guys. Again, I call upon Ugandans in Canada. Please come to the rescue of my two nieces uh, and, and see how you can help. Uh, they are motherless. There is no other family connection down there. The mother has been uh, a very uh, reclusive kind of person. She wasn't uh, a very common person. She didn't associate with lots of people. I doubt she had lots of friends in that environment. But there is two young children there who need guidance. And you people who are down there uh, should show your kindness and see how this matter can be resolved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mitala Muzukuruwa Muswangali. And uh, I know Mr. Ali uh, connected with me regarding this issue. Uh, we have also connected with uh, uh, Carol, uh, who is uh, Pakasara's niece, actually. Uh, so she's also uh, she, she, she's working hard to ensure that uh, those kids get connected to the community in Abbotsford. Uh, we shall do whatever we can in our power uh, to have it, uh, isolated. Uh, uh, I know their mom was an introvert, uh, but that happens sometimes uh, uh, in our communities, especially when you're trying to figure out uh, how to manage uh, your life, uh, your new life uh, in, in, in a new country. So it is it is complicated, uh, but to uh, know well taken care of uh, we grieve with you uh, during this uh, difficult time we are going to try and uh, connect with different uh, community leaders and see uh, and see what we can do really uh, in, in under under these circumstances uh, on that note I want to invite Mr. Bakasara uh, to uh, give us his final remarks regarding this issue of uh, dual citizenship, duality, duality uh, of citizenship. Uh, Mr. Bakasara, your final remarks. You're frozen, I think. Eh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so Mr. Bakasara is frozen for some reason, but I'm pretty sure he's going to come back. Uh, and uh, give us his final remarks regarding this issue. Uh, hopefully, he's uh, he has re uh, realized that uh, he is uh, freezing. Uh, so he will be joining us once he joins us. Well, he, he rejoins. He will give us his uh, final remarks. Uh, but I want to thank going now at Govedida. We were in New to Govedida. Uh, sharing a mbozene, mbozene no sharing or now all you holy ku YouTube or holy Facebook, sharing a mbozene, kuwang mbozene onkuru, uh, beto gera ko, ne wakuba denga tu yoge den yomuru nya nyembe, uh, beto gera ko bin tu yoina okumanya, oklava tino, uh, o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o o to look for the exemptions on how uh, we reconnect with our country. Uh, we should be able to get visas on arrival. I, I think that's very important for, for, for the people who are carrying foreign passports. Uh, we should be able to get visas on arrival uh, and we should be uh, given automatic uh, residence certificates. college. Uh, registering, again, going through registration, uh, 
ndiate leta kano leta kali leta kano uh, leta le, le, basa bane application je na juzamu nga 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 nga, nga, nga saba citizenship ya Canada tinayo jituwe kati application je na juzamu nga saba citizenship ya Canada muja gazaji eh? muja gazaji dalada <laughs> the, the, the state the state wants to know so much about you that's that's, that's kati, about application je na samu nga nga saba citizenship ya ya, ya Canada that, that, that's a property of the government of Canada <laughs> that I shouldn't be sharing with the government of Uganda. Hey, data protection, yeah. There is data yeah. protection. Data protection. Yeah. Application, yeah, yeah. It's a property of the government of Canada. Mumunga Manti in Jibao, Lokuanga, Magaland, registering to become a justice. That nonsense is not going to work with some of us. Let's take it. You need to revisit your, your law. Uh, are the men of the properties is angle of one of those antino and that's not going to happen. I think in those are, I think in those are, there will be a revision of this because the double to gun the issue impact impact assessment, and you really need to assess, you know, how what what is the impact because obviously this is going to have a very severe impact if it is not already having a severe impact. It is already uh, having a severe impact in that Gambia and in Namiko and Oji and go on. Buffy did do a good year. Kologan again and after which Tawi. By no music, but I'm expecting to go away. I hope one guy you move home from Ruja. Nayanga, I know so can up with a brother in my way's invitation later. What nonsense is that? No, it's again to get a Kuzika town that is so compares the invitation later. Again, to apply the online name, which is a slave visual, you could jay. Abamu Baba Gana, Batu Kako Airport, Pearson Airport, no Gana no boarding a gond. Gabaku said the tickets. If you have, a, if you have a ticket that is, not, that, that is not insured, you will get up for a cent. I've heard about it, yeah. I think it's, right. uh, it's unnecessary, really. It I is nonsensical. Uh, it needs to be revisited. And, uh, you know, that's why they, uh, applying these sorts of pressure and engaging this kind of conversations maybe raises the issue again back to the forefront. So that uh, that injustice needs to be corrected. I'm I'm, I'm I'm pretty confident that you know there will be progress that will be made on that specific issue. Yeah, indigenous Ugandans should not be treated like other foreigners who do not have any attachment to the country. Oh. We need to revisit this law as it pertains to how it affects uh, indigenous Ugandans. Absolutely. Omsaja Omunora Kuri de Hoima, Omsajo Musoga Kuri de Jinja, Ove Iganga, Omsajo Munyankole, a Kuri de Embarara, or wherever, and Stegera. Omsajo Mucholi, a Kuri de Yonaja Bazali Dwane Bakurida. You they shouldn't be treated. Ngomu Canada, Yazali Bawano, Ayagalo Genda. Uganda, Obanga, Omute applying for registration, now becoming a naturalized Uganda, and got Tom Clark, I think. Is it Tom Clark? Yeah, that doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take it. I'm Uganda, first naturalized. They are Mukakati. They are just them. Gundi, Munge, and Tom Clark. They are all about Uganda. They never judge Bangi. I've ever seen Uganda. Much I don't know. Baganda, the other language is Jim Fomu Yemu. Even to me, we have to revisit these things. I, I, the notion I, I, of copy and paste is, is, is counterproductive. I uh, and we are, and we have thrived in these countries because we are law abiding citizens, but we are also thriving because we question these laws so that the Bazitun will come back. But why it was a very gained of color? Chileka, see where they say. Right now, to China, I'm going to have a gambit in the second of the immunization. We are still persuading them. Oh. We are still persuading them of the vaccination. This is not why it was a gala. We are not going to send a basau. 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 We But these conversations are still continuing. They are, they are, they are indeed. They are indeed. It's, it's, it's never ending, you know. The, it's never ending. It's never ending. These, 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 these things are so 
they are so mind blogging and, and, and they are so they are so intriguing that you cannot have all the answers just in one go. Now in no, those that those that you is you know Eranga Albert Wagambi Amateka Manja Gaita nga abantubeba singa teba tege de impact yago chichitegeza echo chiva maybe it's a show of disinterest. I luckily I think lots of uh, people in the diaspora they are they they are starting to be more more actively interested and engaged. Um moving moving to a final now sometimes they to be no big journey happening because of that kind of disengagement and the, the, the disinterest in when these processes are initiated. That loud, clear voice that says that no, this is what we feel should be happening in this direction. But I think the, 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 the discussions need to continue. I think uh, the, the, these matters need to be looked at a little bit more critically, more so with the objective of uh, revising the law, if the law is indeed unfair and unjust in, in the way it's been uh, drafted and even applied, then certainly uh, I am of the view that, you know, we need, we need to have a law review and as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Muganda Wange. I'm going to let you go. Mr. Bakasara may not be able to come back, but be, uh, as no. we go, I want you guys to, to think about this. This is the state of the nation. Rifa Mwanga. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Salah.